Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's book launch of Erin McLaughlin's brand new book, The Mind of the Holocaust Perpetrator in Fiction and Nonfiction. This is our fifth and last event in this, uh, just for this academic year in the new Books in Perpetrator Studies series. My name is Susanne Knittel, and I'm Assistant Professor in Comparative Literature at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. I'm the founder of the Perpetrator Studies Network, a growing interdisciplinary and international network of scholars, curators, educators, and artists interested in the study of perpetrators and perpetration of genocide and political mass violence. I'm also the co-editor in chief of the Journal of Perpetrator Research, which is peer reviewed and open access journal at Winchester University Press. And together with Tim Timothy Williams from the Bundeswehr University in Munich, I'm the co-organizer of this uh, new books in perpetrator studies series. And I'm delighted to welcome you today. And I'm also delighted to be moderating today's discussion with uh, such a wonderful book to launch and to celebrate and with such wonderful guests. Now, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to just briefly say a few words about the format of today's event. This is a webinar event and we will start with the presentation of the book and then have the responses by our two discussants. After that, Aaron will have the opportunity to respond to the discussions, and then we will open up for your questions, and I hope you will have many during the general Q&A. We will be taking your questions through the chat, so please, whenever you have uh, something you would like to ask or a comment, please type it in the chat, and I will bring it to the panel in the Q&A. Let me begin by introducing today's wonderful panel. First of all, we have, of course, today's author, Erin McLaughlin. She's professor of German and Jewish studies at Washington University in St. Louis. She's also vice dean of undergraduate affairs, College of Arts and Sciences, and interim chair and interim director of graduate studies. Erin's main research interests are in the areas of Holocaust literature and film and German Jewish literature. She is the author of numerous highly influential articles and books that revolve around the cultural representation of perpetrators. The monographs Second Generation Holocaust Literature, Legacies of Survival and Perpetration from 2006, and of course, The Mind of the Holocaust Perpetrator in Fiction and Nonfiction, which we will be launching today and hearing about today. Then, of course, I would like to mention the co-edited volumes, Persistent Legacy, The Holocaust in German Studies from 2016, together with Jennifer Kapczynski, and The Construction of Testimony, Claude Lanzmann's Shoah and its Outtakes, from 2020, which uh, was co-edited with Brad Prager and Markus Zisselberger. She has published articles in major journals and edited volumes on fictional and non-fictional works of Holocaust literature and film, as well as on such topics as the generational discourse on the Holocaust, the narrative structure of Holocaust literature and film, perpetrator representation and perpetrator trauma, and ethical questions related to Holocaust representation. We are delighted that she will be presenting her book with us and launching her book with us today. Now, our two discussants. First of all, I'd like to welcome Katharina von Kellenbach, who is Professor Emerita of Religious Studies at St. Mary's College of Maryland and is now based in Berlin at the Evangelische Akademie. Her areas of expertise include Holocaust studies, Jewish-Christian relations, feminist theology, and interreligious dialogue. She has published extensively on the topic of guilt, including the monographs, The Mark of Cain, Guilt and Denial in the Lives of Nazi Perpetrators, 
from 2013. And the forthcoming composting guilt, the purification of memory after atrocity. And concluding our wonderfully interdisciplinary panel will be Sue Weiss, who is professor of English literature at the University of Sheffield in the UK. And her research and teaching revolve around 20th and 21st century literature, theory, and film, including Holocaust studies. She has published extensively on Holocaust literature and film. Uh, and of her many books, uh, I would like to name especially the monographs Holocaust Fiction from 2000 and Children Writing the Holocaust from 2004, which examines a wide range of works written by and about child survivors and victims of the Holocaust, as well as a BFI Modern Film Classics volume from 2011 on Claude Lanzmann's classic film Shoah. Together with Jenny Adams, she has edited a volume entitled Representing Perpetrators in Holocaust Literature and Film in 2013. In 2019 and 20, she held a British Academy Senior Fellowship to write a study of the outtake footage from Landman's documentary Shoah. What we're going to do now is um, I would like to uh, first invite Erin to present her book, and she will also read a short excerpt from it. And after that, we will first hear the response uh, from Katharina von Kellenbach and then from Sue Weiss. Then we will have a discussion amongst the panelists, and then I will open the floor uh, and we'll be ready for your questions and comments. So let me hand over to Erin. So thank you so much, Susanna. Um, I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to, to you and to Tim Williams and to the Purpose Trader Studies Network in general for organizing this event. I think it's a really great way to, um, you know, link continents uh, and link us all together. It's, it's quite amazing. I'd also like to thank Sue Weiss and Katharina von Kellenbach for generously agreeing to serve as discussants for the conversation. I, I admire their work so much and I'm super excited to have them here. I'd like to begin by be, uh, giving a brief overview of the scope, argument, and organization of my book, and then I'll read an excerpted section from the book. So first, I'm going to share my screen um, quickly here uh, so that um, I, there's a few things I want to show you from here. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to point out um, the uh, co cover image, which uh, people have asked me about, and I wanted to bring some attention to the artist, who is a, a, a Czechoslovak uh, a Jewish uh, survivor, and he has an amazing um, oeuvre of, of uh, Holocaust-related art, so I encourage you to all visit the website and look at his art. Um, in, uh, in the mind of the Holocaust perpetrator in fiction and nonfiction, I examined cultural constructions of Holocaust perpetrators from the early 1960s to the present that imagine their inner experience, a mode of representation that was once considered taboo. By reproducing the mind of the Nazi perpetrator and attempting to account for his subjective view of his participation in genocide, these seminal texts humanize him, transforming him from the archetype of evil into a complex psychological and moral subject. The evolution of this cultural construct in recent decades is indicative of a shift in how we have come to view perpetrators and how our understanding of them is at least informed by cultural representations as it is determined by historical research. It also bespeaks new modes of engagement with the uncomfortable ethical questions raised by our increasing willingness to take on the perpetrator's perspective, if only provisionally, and to event, view the events of the Holocaust through his eyes. By distinguishing my analysis of these representations according to two types of discourse, the fictional and the non-fictional, I focus on how historical development and the generic conventions each determine in, uh, their psychological and narrative portrayals of their subjects. I trace the historical trajectory of such representations 
arguing that the wave of non-fictional biographies of the 1960s and 1970s that followed the trials of perpetrators in Israel and Germany gave way to the recent boom in fictional portraits, which began in the 1990s. Further, I identify in each work, whether fictional or non-fictional, a certain tension at play that revolves around the ethics of identification. On the one hand, each text offers a relatively mimetic representation of the consciousness of its violent protagonist that is psychologically plausible. In this way, it encourages audience identification on a number of levels. On the other hand, these narratives also employ strategies that at times, uh, at times function to obscure or distort the seemingly transparent window into the perpetrator's minds. They thereby reveal anxieties about the project of undistorted representation they profess to undertake and evoke the potential danger of reader identification with the perpetrator's perspective. As I argue, by utilizing self-conscious filtering strategies to alternately compel and foreclose identification, these texts draw their readers directly into the perpetrator's experience and at the same time defer any unmediated access to the perpetrator's consciousness by retarding their effective connection. Spring, hold on. The book is divided into two parts that focus on the ways in which the mind of the perpetrator has been constructed in non-fictional texts and in fictional discourse. The two main chapters of part one focus on the biographical construction of real life perpetrators produced during the period of the development of Holocaust discourse in the 1960s and 1970s. The texts analyze in this part foreground attempts by journalists and thinkers to create portraits of real life perpetrators, either through the medium of the interview or through analyses of documents and testimony. I begin part one with an historical overview of the development of non-fictional representations and a methodological introduction to the narrative strategies and properties of non-fiction. And I'm gonna read a little bit later from this introduction to part one. Chapter one focuses on the three on three of the numerous biographical portraits of Adolf Eichmann that appeared shortly after his 1961 trial. Not only Hannah Arendt's seminal Eichmann in Jerusalem, but also an important analysis by the Dutch writer Harry Mulish and in an account by William L. Hull, the apostolic pastor ministered to Eichmann in the last weeks of his life. Each of these three mediating figures locates Eichmann's mind in discrete aspects or operations of his performed identity. Arendt constructs Eichmann as a product, product of his own banal language. Mulisch renders Eichmann's mind through his ironic reading of Eichmann's facial features and expressions. And Hull constructs Eichmann's conscious, conscience through his narrow and obsessive focus on what he sees to be the state of Eichmann's soul. Taken collectively, these interpretations show radically disparate perspectives on Eichmann's mind, creating a kaleidoscopic lens rather than a comprehensive profile through which they collectively filter his acts of self-presentation. Chapter two examines Gitta Sereni's journalistic masterwork into that darkness and examination of conscience which constructs the biography of Franz Stangl, the commandant of Sobibor and Treblinka. My analysis focuses on the ethical implications of Sereni's intersubjective encounter with Stangl and elucidates how Sereni frames Stangl's story according to specific master plots that allow her to construct his experience as a narrative of eventual ethical epiphany. Part two, consisting of two main chapters as well, examines four prominent fictional texts that take considerable imaginative license in their depiction of the perspective of their invented perpetrator narrators. The introduction to part two traces the historical trajectory of his fictional representations of the consciousness of perpetrators and highlights some of the important narratological questions raised by these texts including the phenomenon of unreliable narration and the tension between mimetic and anti-mimetic modes of representations in such fiction. 
Chapter three concentrates on one older and one more recent fictional representation of the interiority of perpetrators. Edgar Hilsenrat's The Nazi and the Barber and Jonathan Littell's The Kindly Ones. Both novels, I argue, utilize filtering strategies in the form of a doubled or mediated narrative perspective that both reveals and occludes the perpetrator's mind. Chapter four investigates two texts by Martin Amos that foreground the narrative perspective of Holocaust perpetrators, Time's Arrow from 1991 and The Zone of Interest from 2014. These two texts lie on the opposite ends of the mimetic anti-mimetic spectrum and thus require from their readers, I argue, divergent cognitive and effective reading strategies. Whereas Amos's earlier text forces the reader to engage in complex exercises of interpretation, the later text stimulates the effective modes of empathy and identification. I then conclude the book with a short epilogue that discusses the potential for comparison between cultural representations of the mind of the Holocaust perpetrator and images of perpetrators of violence more generally. So uh, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, because I no longer need it. And I'm going to read a, 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 a kind of conglomeration of excerpts uh, from uh, the introduction to part one, which focuses on narrative strategies and nonfiction. By positing the idea that nonfictional attempts to imagine the mind of the Holocaust perpetrator have gradually been superseded by fictional, fictional explorations that carry on the same project, I trace a historical connection between the nonfictional and fictional texts under investigation here. Beyond this linkage, however, I perceive additional dimensions of correspondence between the two types of discourse, particularly with regard to the structural and aesthetic properties employed by this group of texts. Whereas, as I will argue in part two, the fictional texts take up and transform some of the narrative strategies of nonfiction in their renderings of the interiority of their protagonists, the nonfictional text, texts I investigate in this part avail themselves of what we often think of as fictional, or at the very least literary, techniques in order to shape their narratives of the minds of the real men on whom they focus. In particular, they use the fundamental properties of storytelling and narrative world making to construct out of what uh, Porter Abbott calls the raw flux of events, episodes, actions, interactions, and emotional phenomena in each perpetrator's life, a comprehensible narrative replete with meaningful causal relationships, intelligible motives, coherent behavior, and legible mental attitudes. In this, of course, these, te these texts are no different than any story of the life of a real person, which necessarily follows processes of construction analogous to those found in non-referential or fictional narratives. Indeed, according to Jerome Brunner, the very notion of a person's life is, in fact, a narrative construct. Quote, the mimesis between life, so-called, and narrative is a two-way affair. That is to say, just as art imitates life in Aristotle's sense, so in our Oscar Wilde's, life imitates art. Narrative imitates life, life imitates narrative. Life in this sense is the same kind of construction of the human imagination as a narrative is. It is constructed by human beings through active ratiocination, by the same kind of ratiocination through which we construct narratives. When someone tells you his life, it is always a cognitive achievement rather than a through the clear crystal recital of something univocally given. In the end, it is a narrative achievement." End of quote. In Brunner's view, the very notion of a person's life proceeds from the narration of that life. Moreover, once perceived as a distinct phenomenon, a person's life exists as a product of, quote, the narrative models a particular culture makes available to describing the course of life, end of quote, meaning the lexica, plot structures, character types, and interpretive frameworks that circulate within a given culture to make sense of experience. By virtue of this broad and recurrent circulation of particular gen generic templates, 
a culture is thus able to perceive and narrate life experience in ways both personally and socially comprehensible. The texts I will explore in the following two chapters are also subject to the dynamic that Bruner terms life as narrative. The narratives by Arendt, Mulish, Hull, and Sereni all resort by necessity to what Hannah Maritoya calls, quote, culturally mediated models of narrative sense making, end of quote, in order to construct comprehensible accounts of the lives of men whom they seek to understand. However, given the subject of their biographical portraits, the inner lives of men whose experience lies ostensibly outside the bounds of conventional ethical norms, a certain paradox also attends the te text's narrativization of the perpetrators' lives. On the one hand, they register what Arendt terms the unprecedented situation of the men whose minds they seek to illuminate and whose participation in a genocide so unrivaled in scale and seemingly unparalleled in routinized brutality poses a considerable challenge to traditional moral categories and familiar, familiar historical frameworks. As Sereni reports saying to Stangl, quote, things had happened to and inside him which had happened to hardly anyone else ever, end of quote. A sentiment echoed in various ways by the authors of the other texts as well, who take on the demanding task of translating the singular preternatural quality of the perpetrator's experience for an audience to whom it appears remote and incomprehensible. On the other hand, while several of the texts under discussion develop innovative and unconventional strategies to represent the paradoxically anomalous quality of the crimes committed by these rather ordinary men, they also seek commonly intelligible narrative vehicles through which they can make the perpetrator's experience legible to both themselves and their audiences. They thus reach for, sometimes deliberately, at other times reflexively, what Bruner calls recipes for structuring experience particularly as we will see familiar generic conventions and formal frameworks not uncommonly attributed to fiction, such as narrative master plots associated with genre fiction and creative practices of mind reading. Such multi-layered exchanges between the conventions of fiction and nonfiction in turn necessitate practices of reading able to recognize and account for the, for the effects of the text's recourse to what Jens Brockmeier calls, quote, a shared cultural canon of narrative conventions that cuts across the putative divide between fiction and nonfiction. By closely attending to the ways in which the texts embed their constructions of the mind of the Holocaust perpetrator within narrative frameworks and scripts that predicate particular epistemological and effective interpretations, such reading practices not only clarify the processes by which the authors construct the minds of the men they seek to understand, but also acknowledge the reciprocal nature of fiction and nonfiction in how we construct and make sense of historical lives. At the same time, however, while these nonfictional explorations of the mindset and motivations of Holocaust perpetrators avail themselves of formal and structural strategies that we conventionally associate with fiction, they are not themselves fictions, and we should be careful not to conflate them with the fictional accounts of perpetrators. For that reason, it is equally important to attend to the text's ontological, referential, and historical specificity. As Daniel Lehman argues, quote, nonfiction depends on the materiality of its characters' bodies and on a reference to outside events that is more powerful than most form of fiction, end of quote. In particular, and to state the obvious, not only are the characters in this corpus of, the, of text real people who are at one time involved in the concrete historical events of the Holocaust, but their authors are also actual persons who met personally with their subjects or engaged intimately with their histories from a remove. The stakes of their projects to represent the interiority of the perpetrators under examination are thus of a much different nature than those of the fictional texts. While both modes of writing are bound to some degree of referentiality and their depictions of the Holocaust and its after effects, 
The authors of the non-fictional texts have much less freedom to invent people and events, to creatively reframe motivations and causality, and to grant apparently unrestricted access to the thoughts and feelings of the perpetrators they endeavor to depict, than do either the authors or the narrators of fictional representations. Even when these texts creatively reconstruct or even misrepresent aspects of the perpetrators' lives and narratives, they are still subject to the referential conventions of nonfiction. While these nonfictional texts confront particular limitations by virtue of their referential status, however, they also demonstrate some of the complexities of nonfictional discourse, especially, quote, what Lehman, well, especially what Lehman uh, calls, quote, the way that writers of nonfiction implicate themselves within the text, end of quote, particularly through the cultivation of an explicit and interventional authorial persona. All of the texts examined here feature not the ostensibly omniscient, impersonal, impersonal neutral perspective of the heterodiegetic reporter of objective facts, but the deeply invested and implicated presence of a homodiegetic narrator whose involvement in the story he or she tells becomes an integral part of the narrative itself. This is particularly true in the case of Sereny and Hull, both of whom become protagonists within the diegesis of their interviews with the respective perpetrators. But it applies to Mulish and Arendt as well, whose attendance at and personal engagement with the Eichmann trial becomes an integral part of their narratives. Moreover, the authors examine in this part not only construct explicit narrative persona in their text, but also commit themselves to exacting dialogical and intersubjective relationships with their subjects, either as interviewers in face-to-face -face encounters or as interpreters who evaluate the perpetrator from a distance. Such encounters have not only consequences for the self-understanding of the persons being interviewed and for the narratives of their, of their lives that are produced via the dialogue between interviewer and interviewee, but also an impact on the interviewers themselves. The authorial persona are transformed as well by the dialogical interaction of the engagement. With regard to this particular corpus of texts, the operations of intersubjectivity are at work in a number of dimensions, including the author's effective cognitive and ethical investment in their projects to scrutinize the minds of their subjects, the dialogical relationships, whether direct or indirect, they cultivate with the perpetrators to produce a narrative about their participation in genocidal violence, their self-reflexive meditations on how their experiences with the perpetrators impinge on their own selfhood, and the story that emerges from synthetic cross-pollination between the perpetrator's narration or self-performance and the author's cathectic ties to their projects. An additional aspect of such intersubjective investment is the operation of empathy, which is fundamental to the author's projects of mind reading their subjects. Empathy, especially in its cognitive form, is predicated on the operation of mind reading. We thus empathize with another to the extent that we can attribute mental states to that person. However, mind reading may not necessarily lead to empathy. Although the authors of all the non-fictional texts discussed in this part engage, as I have argued, in exercises in mind reading in their projects of constructing the mind of the perpetrator, the operation of empathy plays out to differing degrees in their interactions with their subjects. Arendt, for example, engages in both extensive acts of mind reading and operations of empathy in her analysis of Eichmann. However, her empathetic stance is undercut by her caustic irony and her insistence on Eichmann's mindlessness. Mulish's portrait of Eichmann, on the other hand, is characterized by a relatively high empathetic disposition. Mulish even notes at one point, quote, the boundaries between him and me are lapsing, end of quote. As Eichmann's spiritual advisor, Hull performatively simulates empathy with Eichmann through his connect concern for the state of his soul, 
yet he obstinately, obstinately refuses to consider Eichmann's experience from his own frame of reference. His, empathy connect, his empathetic connection thus resembles, at least in part, what Gulbant and Villersley term tactical empathy, which they define as, quote, the emotional and cognitive projection of oneself into the perspective of, or situation of another for deceptive purposes, end of quote. Despite Sereni's warning that empathy is dangerous, her position vis-a-vis -vis Stangl, on the other hand, is fundamentally empathetic. In fact, as Rachel Rosenblum argues, quote, Sereni's empathy is a serious weapon in its resolution to force Stangl to occupy a subjective position which until then had remained empty, end of quote. The empathetic relationship that develops in these texts thus varies appreciably with regard to with regard to both kind and degree, demonstrating the considerable diversity in the author's approaches to their respective subjects. Taken together, the four texts that I examine in detail in the following two chapters demonstrate the facile and malleable potential of non-fictional discourse for exploring the complex inner lives of figures whose histories of violence pose challenges to attempts to understand their behavior, attitudes, and memories. In their quest for an appropriate vehicle through which they can represent experiences and mental attitudes commonly regarded as incomprehensible or ethically provocative, the authors of these texts adopt and reshape narrative conventions often associated with fiction, thereby expanding the capacity of nonfiction to imagine phenomena that resist empirical validation. As mediating figures who are tasked with translating the perpetrators' minds for their readers, these authors also consign themselves to intersubjective and empathetic relationships with their subjects. The portraits of the perpetrators that emerge in these texts thus reveal as much about the historical conditions of their construction, the representational dynamics that shape them, and the commitments of their authors as they do the contents of the minds who perpetrated genocidal violence. Okay, so that ends my uh, reading uh, from the book, and I'm going to give the floor now to Katarina von Kellenbach. Okay, I don't know whether I can't quite see myself, um, but I guess I'm here. Yes, can, can you can people see me? <laughs> yes. Okay. So I also want to thank the Perpetrator Network um, for uh, giving us this opportunity to, to discuss this really fabulous book um, that Aaron has written and that has been very long in the making. Um, Aaron and I were fellows at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and I know how hard it was to write this book. Um, and so I want to start uh, with uh, this um, observation how, you know, that there has been a profusion of literature on perpetrator uh, and both fictional and non-fictional. And when we were at the Holocaust Museum, um, we, uh, there were already some of these tensions around uh, the fact that you know, we came from different disciplines. So Aaron is from literature and literary studies. I'm from religious studies. And within the field of uh, Holocaust studies, but also perpetrator studies, there's a preponderance of historians um, and a strong sort of emphasis on getting to the facts. And when you come from literature or religious studies, uh, you know, there is a sort of a need to defend uh, the uh, the subjective and the fictional, and so I I was so so grateful to read this book um, precisely because it plays on the boundary between the objective and the subjective, between the fictional and the non-fictional, and it really brings out the tensions between. Um, between these fields. And I think this is especially important now also, and of course dangerous to some extent, because we live in a world of post-truth. Uh, 
where facts and the objective documents and records um, have become newly embattled again. And there's an even stronger sort of push to return to the facts and the documents and the records and to, um, to be critical of fiction. And so I think to have a book that actively explores and validates the, um, you know, the need to, to look at both fictional and non-fictional literature on perpetrators is very, very um, necessary and important. Um, as you saw in the uh, very comprehensive overview, there are two parts to this book. One which deals with mind reading and the other one deals with imagining. I am going to focus on the mind reading part more than the imagining part. And that has to do both with my particular work, which was looking at the relationships and interactions of prison chaplains working with Nazi perpetrators beginning in 45, um, all the way to the eighties. Um, and so I, and of course I was looking at the documents of these prison chaplains working with Nazi perpetrators. So I both uh, studied the, the mind reading of the prison chaplains, but also did my own mind reading um, of what I thought was going on. Um, and of course, the reason one needs to read the mind, and I'm just trying to push the button here on the, my timing. The reason mind reading is important when it comes to perpetrators is that they are recalcitrant, obstinate, closed off, deceitful, in denial, lying, um, it is almost impossible to really, um, or it seems to be in the nature of perpetration that the truth is hidden or becomes opaque. And so anybody approaching a perpetrator has to penetrate, which is a very you know, phallic word, but move beyond those walls. And that is certainly also part of the job description of prison chaplains working with Nazi perpetrators. Um, and so I wanna focus on that part and also acknowledge uh, the very powerful selection that Aaron does of looking at Eichmann and Stangl and picking uh, you know, very specific interactions that of Hannah Arendt, uh, Mulisch and Hall, in, in the case of Eichmann and Stangl. And I wanna say a little bit about those particular mind reading scenarios um, because they um, say much about the relationship. Those are mind reading is in a relational event. And um, they say to some extent as much about the reader as the read. And um, so they, Aaron uses this uh, great word of intersubjective intermediation. And she talks about the filtering strategies that need to be in place. It's a dance between uh, identifying and, uh, and maintaining distance. And all of her subjects uh, really are very explicit about that dance between drawing near and, and moving back. And I certainly know that even from my own research that I sort of felt myself, you know, trying to come closer, trying to identify, trying to understand, and at the same time needing to uh, distance and contextualize. So I thought it was interesting that um, those uh, examples of um, successful mind reading uh, that Aaron is uh, analyzing are themselves, except for Hall, who is clearly a failure, um, Jewish, and therefore members of victim of, uh, survivors of sorts, because in their very nature and their very existence, they are capable of contextualizing 
and um, uh, interpreting the lies that uh, they are being presented in a way that my German Christian prison chaplains were not. Even when they uh, attempted or were determined to engage critically with the mind or as they would say, the soul of the perpetrators, they were not capable of truly penetrating or moving beyond the deceptions and the denials in the way that a, a Gita Sereni is able of doing. So this is in the 1960s. And um, these were uh, Jewish interlocutors who were willing to engage in a rather uh, intimate way with the minds of perpetrators. Um, and they were capable of seeing and um, formulating insights that none of the German non-victim, I mean, and those are all categories obviously that are hard to, um, uh, you know, they shouldn't be essentialized, but uh, they were just not able to do the kind of filtering or the kind of um, uh, empathetic identification that was necessary uh, to, to, to truly um, make, you know, to tru truly interpret uh, beyond the facade uh, of, the, of the perpetrators. So I, I thought that uh, for me, the theory of mind that uh, Aaron uh, develops in the introduction was really extremely uh, helpful to try to grasp the kinds of relationships and operations that are necessary in order to move beyond the, the, this wall of deception that is characteristic of perpetrators. And I think continues to be characteristic of perpetrators. And that's of course in the last chapter, um, Aaron ends there. The second point I, I want to make, uh, which is very, very important, I think, for all disciplines thinking uh, about perpetrators is to really look at the narrative dynamics and the, the devices and conventions. And that uh, is of course the field of literature. And so Aaron says that there are really two master plots that uh, inform the both non-fictional and fictional accounts of perpetrators. One is the detective story where uh, the, the writer begins to un unearth the truth of what has happened. So you begin in, in a, against this wall of unknowing and then you look for the evidence and you find the clues and you put them together. Um, and the other master plot is the confession narrative. And that is of course uh, in my field in particular. And both of these master plots, and I think that is a very, very important point, um, end in a, in a closure. And that is where this is very, very, a very dangerous or inappropriate narrative device. The detective story ends with epistemological closure. That is to say, it ends with the truth. And of course, we must come to, uh, to the recognition that when it comes to perpetrators, we may never know the truth. And to pretend that we know fully the mind of another is a form of um, you know, hubris. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a, false, a fault that I think we need to be aware of. And in the case of the confession narrative, there is the, uh, the, the problem of ethical closure namely that we will come to conversion or reconciliation or forgiveness uh, as, it, as it were. And those two um, narrative conclusions to the interaction with, with perpetrators need to be avoided at, at all costs. Uh, 
but they're you know they're part of the plot line that ends with a climax or a catharsis. And Gita Sereni, of course, uh, really falls for that catharsis, uh, namely the confessional moment when he reveals the truth and then he dies. Um, and that may or may not be entirely truthful to what she actually experienced. I wondered about another account that is also on the boundary between fictional and non-fictional, and that is Simon Wiesenthal's uh, The Sunflower, which as far as I know, I mean, it's, we don't know whether that is actually a historical account. Uh, in my experience um, of thinking through perpetrators uh, in the, in the um, pastoral uh, context, you know, there were very few uh, perpetrators who actually confess the way Carl does in Simon Wiesenthal's account. So my sense is that it is more fictional than non-fictional. In any case, the brilliance of the sunflower is that it evades and avoids the ethical closure. That is to say, it ends with a question. And because it ends with a refusal to grant absolution, uh, because it ends with silence and the question, what would you have done? It is uh, a continuing to, um, you know, it continues to reverberate through the generations and it has been um, released over and over again with new responses to that, uh, to that account. So I think that is a, um, Oops, that is my 10 minutes. Um, so I will, I will try to come to an end here. I just wanted to say uh, something about the imagining, which uh, has not attracted me that much. Um, and I think it is because of my own subject position as a German uh, second generation reader that I still find it unattractive and unpleasurable to really put myself into the mind of the perpetrator entirely. And here again, the authors that are in the book are actually non-German authors. And I just think it's not entirely ex accidental that this is a genre that, uh, that is not quite open to people who are by virtue of culture, language, family, uh, society too close and therefore not really um, able to put themselves into the mind of the perpetrator. So uh, I will just end it here and hand over to Sue Weiss and then open up to the discussion afterwards. Hello, um, I've got to ask if you can hear me. Um, I hope somebody will. Yes, yes. Can hear you. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, it's been great to hear people's thoughts and congratulations again to Erin on this wonderful book. Um, I'm full of admiration for it as a meticulous history and analysis of the image of the Nazi perpetrator. It's written with sophistication, but also great clarity, as you could probably tell from the extracts and also from what Katerina was just saying, taking full time to set out the conceptual questions that it then explores. I felt that Erin gave definitive readings of texts that have affected and troubled her and other readers as milestones in this genre, um, as we've heard, including Gitta Sereny's Into That Darkness, on the former Treblinka commandant, Franz Stengel, which Erin calls Sereny's masterwork, Hannah Arendt and others on Adolf Eichmann, and fiction that has provoked controversy precisely because it represents a perpetrator perspective by Edgar Hilsenrat, Jonathan Littell, and in two revealingly different forms, Martin Amis. Erin's book, examines crucial definitions of terms, including the word perpetrator itself. And this was one of many points that I felt I had never really reflected upon, which is perhaps overly general, but there's no real substitute for it. 
The book reminds us that such figures do not deliver testimony, but as we've been hearing, rather confession. It sets out the precise modes of identification on the parts of readers, clarifies the significance of both parts of the banality of evil phrase, defines the unreliability on a host of levels of literary perpetrators, and states that perpetrator fiction as a phrase, which I myself has used, refers specifically to texts written from the perspective, if not always in the voice, of such a figure. None of this has been set out before in this way or in a single volume. The book clarifies what it is that the texts it analyzes are looking for, and that is the inner world of the perpetrators, their motives, feelings, conscience, and self-conception. As Max Au, the protagonist in Jonathan Littell's novel, The Kindly Ones, thinks about Ukrainian murderers, how had they got to this point? What would they think of all this later on? Surely this is the very question that haunts us. There are two of many of Erin's findings that particularly struck me each registering a way of taking stock of efforts to approach perpetrators. First, Erin reveals the deep connections, as we've just heard from Katerina as well, between nonfiction and fiction. It's not just factual detail that appears in novels, but the very form of journalistic writing. Erin shows the influence of Serenese and Arendt's works in their efforts to present an individual like Stengel or Eichmann, Indeed, Erin argues that fiction is the successor to these documentary writings that are now, for obvious reasons, far less common. She means by this that the figure of the author, who includes an account of their own reactions to their subject, reappears in the fictions as a narrator or as another mediating fictional figure who responds to the perpetrator as we read. Erin perceives specific fictional strategies in, Erin, in Serenese nonfiction, and these are those of the confession and even detective novel, as we've just been hearing about. I'm sorry to give a spoiler, but at the end of Into That Darkness, Stengel's apparent admission of guilt is hailed by Sereny as the culmination of her work, confirmed by the fact that he had a fatal heart attack very soon after his words to her. He said, I should have died, I would have preferred to die rather than this. Erin convincingly argues that it's the other way round. Stengel's confession is not just hollow, but also trite, seeming to suggest that he would prefer death to imprisonment. It's not his confession that makes his death inevitable. Rather, Stengel's death allows his last words to be viewed as a confession. As Erin says, his death offers the closure that his final words, taken alone, cannot offer. Given this analysis, I started to wonder if Claude Lanzmann's filmic practice in his documentary Shoah was influenced by Serenese in Into That Darkness. In both cases, individuals are induced to talk by the interviewer's great knowledge and familiarity with the events. The interviewers place themselves within the frame of the investigation becoming a character in Serenie's case and a filmic actor in Lanzmann's. But unlike Serenie, or most of the writers considered here, Lanzmann also includes survivor utterance. A second central feature of Erin's argument is that in fiction, the familiar elements of narrative form inevitably respond to the topic of the perpetrator. Further than this, narrative experiments or disruptions are actually a way of telling the story and crucially of reaching the reader, drawing us in, making us interpret, feel uncomfortable, close to or rejecting of the main character. In Erin's words, these works give us an important model, not only for understanding evil, but also for understanding how we understand it. In every case, as she puts it, two antithetical impulses are present, efforts to reveal the contents of the perpetrator's mind, and at the same time, through particular strategies of filtering, to occlude it. For this reason, 
Holocaust perpetrator texts are polarizing, uncomfortable and controversial, yet also vital as a way of engaging with the legacy of the Holocaust. That is, literary form tells its own story of the individual's moral catastrophe, sometimes supporting and sometimes at odds with the actual plot. I have a question about this, which we might discuss, which is whether this takes place to a new or a different degree when we're reading about a perpetrator, or is this true of any extreme subject? This close fit between form and content is shown by Erin in relation to Martin Amos's two novels about Auschwitz in a very convincing way, I feel. Thus, Paul Doll, a fictional Auschwitz commandant in Amos's the novel The Zone of Interest, is an unreliable narrator. For instance, in his descriptions of selections on the ramp, in a way that reveals something of the perpetrator's mind, he's unreliable not because he lacks knowledge of what happens on the ramp, or fails to understand its implications, but because of his ethical deficiency, in Erin's phrase, and psychological disavowal of the moral dimensions of his role. In Amos's earlier novel, Time's Arrow, which is told backwards by a split personality, there is more, a crafty manipulation, as Erin says, and a deliberate refusal by the narrator to relate his own agency in events. Does this narrative deception succeed where a realist depiction could not offer an image of a Nazi mental state? Erin answers this in a crucial summary of the central issues. She says, time's arrow shows the hazards of relying on a perpetrator telling his own story and of readers' efforts to interpret that perspective. I'm going to conclude with three questions and a final observation. My first question is about the idea of the everyday or ordinary perpetrator. We are now far from an earlier view of considering Nazis as mentally ill and giving them Rorschach blocked tests. However, questions about motives in relation to Nazi crimes might make us consider more broadly what Freud describes as the enormous effort required to retain so-called civilized behavior, suggesting that suppressed instincts to dominate, enslave and murder, to which all humans are subject, were simply released. So the disavowal of the true meaning of events is to be expected by those who had experienced such unleashing. This leads to my second question, which is one about gender and masculinity, since all the texts here are about men. Yet, of course, as Erin acknowledges, there were also female perpetrators. But as she rightly adds, there are almost no works about these women from within, although they are sometimes represented from the outside. Even in Bernhard Schlink's novel, The Reader, which Erin has also written about, the female former camp guard, Hannah, is heard on her own account on only two brief occasions. I've recently come across two creative writing PhDs on this very topic, so perhaps this almost taboo subject will soon start to appear in the public realm. My third question is one that Erin's alluded to already, which was about the cover illustration, and it seemed to me that we could almost see into Eichmann's mind behind the facade in this particular image. It made me wonder what the role is of the visual realm, including the amazing experiment that Erin analyzes in the book on the part of Harry Mulish in his bisecting a famous photograph of Eichmann's face and matching them up the wrong way round to reveal two unknown visages, a bland composed human face and the agonized witness. Finally, in the past few days, Events have demonstrated the relevance of Erin's work for other atrocities, as she argues for in her conclusion. In The Hague this week, Ratko Mladic's appeal against the charge of genocide for his crimes at Srebrenica was unsuccessful, yet he was not charged with genocide for events in other locations. A Bosnian refugee journalist made a comparison, supporting what Erin argues that comparison and connection is crucial, 
And this journalist says, one way to simplify what happened at Mladic's trial is to imagine that at the Nuremberg trials, the accused Nazis were convicted for atrocities in camps in Poland, but not in concentration camps in Austria. As well as this example, Luke Holland's documentary Final Account has just been released, in which the filmmaker interviews former Nazi perpetrators, one among whom tries to convince young people today not to fall into right-wing views. It's clearly a live topic, and congratulations again to Erin on her achievement. Thank you so much. First, Erin, for the presentation of the book, for the overview, and also for reading from it. Thank you, Katarina and Sue, for those excellent and thought-provoking responses. Erin, would you like to respond to the responses? Well, there's so much here. Uh, thank you. Wow, I, I, I'm speechless, although I have to say something. So, um, and I've taken so many notes. Um, first of all, I really do appreciate, it was clear to me that both of you engaged very deeply with uh, my work. And as many of you know, nobody really expects anybody to read their books and certainly not so carefully and certainly not at the, right after it comes out. So, you know, one expects maybe three or four years later for someone to quote it. So I'm very grateful. It's, it's a, a real treat for me to, to, to see my, what I've been working on kind of uh, filtered as it were through the, the, the work of the two of you and, and your vast experience and your own um, really uh, insightful perspectives. And um, it did, you know, a lot of the things that you both brought out were things that I struggled with and really had a hard time um, you know, pinning down. That's one reason the book took me so long. Um, but I, I'm really glad to know that you recognize those things and that that, um, that, that came out. Uh, uh, Katarina, you know, this, this idea of why mind reading is so important, and it's because we don't have, we don't have a large body of testimony from perpetrators. They weren't running around telling everybody they knew. I mean, I guess, I mean, there is evidence Historians will say that they talked about it, they wrote home, they wrote postcards, but in the post-war period, they were pretty, uh, they clammed up. And I know that your work, uh, Catalina, really shows that even in um, pastoral settings where you, one is ostensibly allowed to say whatever one wants and, and really is encouraged to, they clammed up and they didn't. And part of that, I, I argue, is is because they didn't, you know, they didn't want to see themselves as culpable. They didn't want to reveal themselves as culpable to others. But I also think there really these narrative frameworks didn't exist in in such a way um, uh, to um, to that the, they couldn't find the thing the, the narrative frameworks to be able to to give their own testimony. And so the these amazing interviewers in in the in the 60s and 70s who set out to to figure this stuff out and to really try to get the, to pin these men down really dealt it was a dance as you said and they really dealt um, with a lot of uh, resistance um, and at the same time that resistance told tells a story the resistance to acknowledge one's own culpability is itself a, a kind of a story um, and uh, you know I had noticed, Katarina, um, that a lot of the uh, fictional work that had been done was done by specifically Jewish writers. I had I had thought about this a, a little bit with regard to Eichmann um, as well, but I think you make a very good point that this really is an endeavor that is difficult to bring out from within the culture that inherited the perpetrator legacy. It just, it's, as you said, it's a difficult, the mind reading, it's, I think there's a little too much connection. There, there, there's a, le, there's a, a, a fuzziness between the perpetrators and their culture and their descendants that doesn't allow for that clear, that clarity. Um, and I think that's a really good point. I wish I had made it in my book, um, but that's, a, that's another book to, to really, that that, that that's why these things often um, uh, appear from the, the outsider figures like Sereni or Hilsenrat or Arendt or Mulish, 
um, that, that that's where that comes from. Um, also, your point about Wiesenthal, I thought that was a really fascinating point that, that, that um, Wiesenthal's The Sunflower has been variously seen as fiction and nonfiction. Often it's just assumed to be nonfiction, but literary scholars tend to treat it as fiction. And I think that that is um, a really, that, um, you know, these, these forms that variously have been called fiction and nonfiction, Elie Wiesel's uh, Night is another, right? That people are still arguing about this. I think it, it makes a good point that uh, that, that kind of um, lack of closure ha can happen in such a hybrid form, but, it, but the nonfictional texts seem to want the closure, um, some kind of closure. Mulish, I, said, I think, resists it more than the others. Arendt acknowledges, you know, her inability to really grasp Eichmann, but she's very confident of how she feels about him. And Serenity really does try to manipulate any, everything into the kind of story that is satisfying to her. She really undertakes the project. She says, I was looking for a man who could, who could reveal his conscience to me. I knew that I would find one. And in this one, I found this man, I found it. And it really tells so much about her desire, uh, which I think was also, you know, that's a, a desire that's linked to, to her uh, social justice work, to her a relief work. It's a desire for, you know, clarity and healing in a universe. And, and I think she, she plumped it up. It wasn't there. Um, so Sue. <laughs> You have so many, uh, also so many great points. Um, the uh, the I, I'm glad that you also see what I see is that fiction is looking toward that externalized. It, 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 you have in the nonfiction this externalized evaluating figure, and the fiction, even though it's it's telling the story from the voice in the voice of the perpetrator, there are these externalized instances that allow for some kind of, of judgment outside of the perpetrator's mind. And in some cases, this is, you know, Martin Amos creating a split figure, a soul that's viewing it, that's experiencing everything backwards, which allows for some sort of innocence or at least a, a, a feigned innocence. And I think that's the real problem that fiction has with, uh, with first persons, first person narration is we, we it, 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 it has to indicate something outside the narrator. And it can do this, but it, it has to, to very carefully craft the unreliable narration that we recognize or the um, you know, alternate viewpoints. And I think that all four of the novels try very, very intentionally to do this um, and you know, succeed to various degrees. Um, you bring up uh, of Lanzmann, uh, which I, of course, very much enjoy our long term uh, discussion of Lanzmann and Lanzmann's perpetrators, which you can't seem to get away, away from and don't really want to get away from them. And what's so interesting is I agree with you that Lanzmann and Sereni are doing the same thing, but Lanzmann would, of course, come, as you know, in his, um, his autobiography, he's like, oh, Sereni, you know, she thought she could know these people. She thought, you know, one could get some truth. I never thought that you could get the truth. I never, but yet their, their strategies are almost exactly alike. Although his are more, hers are empathetic and his are hostile. But, but apart from that, they're very similar. And they both become characters in the, in the uh, texts. Um, I think I would agree with you that what we're finding here, it would be true of the uh, narration of any extreme subject. I don't think that the Holocaust po poses a, a, a unique, or it has unique properties in this regard. I think we're able to recognize it because of the shock value and the inevitable ethical questions that come up with Holocaust fiction and Holocaust nonfiction. But I think that these things would be um, operative in, in the narration of any, um, any perpetrator of violence or any in, instigator. And I, uh, one person, Alana Gobel in her, uh, Gomel, in her book, 
blood scripts really was, I, um, it really shows that that narration of violence is, does uh, pose a challenge. And I think this is where I would see connections. I don't see the Holocaust as being unique in this regard. It's just there and very, a very instructive example. Um, and then uh, the cover image, uh, which I don't analyze in the book. Um, I wasn't sure that I would get it. It took me a long time to get it. The um, artist's family is very, and rightfully so, very protective of his um, oeuvre. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that they are. Um, so I, I didn't analyze it, but uh, for me, this, um, what I find quite interesting, and this loops back then to what Katarina was saying, is that it's often um, the victims themselves that had to mind rape the perpetrators, even in the moment. Mark Roseman has written about this victim's views of what the perpetrator's motives were. Uh, and I think that that is something that um, is quite poignant, that often it's the, the understanding and the attempts at understanding are coming from the people who are being um, who are, who, who are receiving the violence, who are being um, um, subjugated or who are being um, uh, tortured or uh, uh, in some way um, the, the objects of violence. And I think there's something quite poignant about that, that, that often it's not the perpetrators themselves who are even interested in knowing what they're doing, it's the, it's the, it's the victims. And then yes, Sue, masculinity is written all over this. This is one thing I don't get into, uh, or very, I kind of, I mention it very briefly in the introduction, so I don't have to mention it again. Uh, but I think you make a really excellent point and that, um, you know, it's clearly the, the, the preponderance of perpetrators in the Holocaust were, were male. So it's sort of, uh, it's sort of the, the image that's so big that one doesn't even often have to uh, look at it. Although I know Katarina has done a lot of work on masculinity and, um, and uh, perpetrators, but I do agree with you that um, the, 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 the general cultural taboo of, of presenting women as, as interior subjects um, that go back to the you know, 18th century novel, you know better than anyone is professor of English, that this is operative here as well. And it's, it's that we find it even much more comfortable to inhabit the minds of such men as these as to really fully um, to engage with female narrators. And, and so you know, I think that's a, a I, I applaud that we have writers that are going there because this, uh, this is something I, wanna, I definitely want to see. Thank you, Erin. And um, there may be responses now again from the uh, <laughs> discussions, but uh, we have now some questions in the chat. So I would like to uh, uh, open or go to the audience's questions. If that's OK, maybe we can then round off with a last uh, round. So there's two questions from the audience that deal a little bit with the corpus of, of uh, text that you have selected, Erin. If you can uh, see it, I would. Um, uh, Rebecca Slodonik um, asks about how you narrow down the texts that you chose to dedicate entire chapters to, especially also in light of the, as you also say, proliferation uh, of texts. And then Joanne Pettit also asks um, about um, the number of texts that centralize the figure of the perpetrator, but that are not autodiegetic, and that we can still consider as part of the canon of perpetrator fiction. These cases often employ a similar uh, strategy of bringing the reader in and simultaneously pushing them away. And so I guess the question is if you could say more about the decision to focus on first person accounts um, and other thoughts on the autodiegetic mode. Yes, um, these are really good questions. Um, so as many of you know, trying to determine the scope of the book is the, really the hard work. The writing of it is so easy in a way. It's the determining where, what it's going to be. And this book, uh, when I presented it to my publisher, was about 500 pages, and I had to cut things. I had a chapter um, on Lanzmann, so I was actually going to include film as well. It then real, I realized, you know, let's 
make it a little bit more narrow. So that's one reason why I, do, I, I cut any of the visual aspects out. Um, but uh, it, the book kind of evolved over time with various areas I was working in. And uh, I'm going to start with, I think, uh, Joan's um, question, because I think that relates to that in that I really was interested, I started early on interested in perpetrators telling their own stories. Uh, so that became the place that, um, you know, I, I, how does one narrate one's own history of violence? That was sort of my the general question. Um, and then um, for, for completely different, um, you know, for different projects, I started reading uh, up on Treblinka because I was working on Lansman. And that brought me to Serenity, whom I'd read before. And I began to in, be interested in the scene in which someone narrates their own history of violence. And so, uh, you know, a lot, it was a lot of pushing and pulling and bringing in of other texts. I thought about uh, reading Rudolf Hirsch's memoir uh, as a non-fictional text. And, and um, so, you know, a lot of texts came in and out of this. Uh, but once I started writing, and as many, if any of you who've seen the book know, and if you know me, you know this, is that I tend to really dive into close readings. And so that's the tension for me is really providing an entire, you know, however many 40 pages on Sereni's book. And I could have written more and in fact, cut more, uh, cut a lot out of it and um, trying to have enough text to really probe a dynamic. And so for Joan, I, you know, in your book, you really do kind of cut across that heterodiagetic, homodiagetic uh, divide, the autodiagetic divide. And you're really, and I agree, you're showing that, you know, there is, there are a lot of similarities between these narrators who are perpetrators and narrators who are observing perpetrators. For me, that was just a, a decision I wanted to, um, to kind of, I wanted to narrow it and I really began to then, as I began to work with the non-fictional text, I really started to see that these narrators were replicating the scene of narration in the non-fictional texts. That the, that the externalized figure of the evaluator or interviewer was then internalized in the autodiagetic narrator, which then kind of pushed away, um, uh, even further pushed away consideration of non-autodiagetic non-autodiagetically narrated texts. Rebecca, um, that's, I kind of got to your question. Uh, it's, a, it's a dance to, to decide on this. And I know, um, you know, Joan in her book treats way more texts than I do. So I, um, you know, she's, she's able to make conclusions about a larger, uh, the larger phenomenon of perpetrator fiction. And I rely on her conclusions um, than I'm able to make because I'm not, I'm not talking about the entire corpus, and she's really trying to investigate most of the most of the corpus. For me, it's really about trying to get in depth, and those stories that um, I feel need to be told about these texts. And in a sense, if I'm not obsessed about the text, either negatively or positively, that's when I got rid of it. I, I needed to have a certain kind of itch and like whole. Oh, his text, uh, Katarina, I know you've read it, uh, and you're one of the few people who've read it. It's an awful text. It's just terrible. It's just a, it's a, it's a tell-all book that was massaged into something because he generally he wanted to make money out of it, out of it, out of it. And uh, but it, it was, it was such a negative example for me um, that I really wanted to kind of say, look at, look, this is what's happening. And in a sense, it was low-hanging fruit. He's an apostolic minister. He's trying, all he cares about is whether I can confesses or not. And by, and not really whether he confesses or not, whether he confesses a relationship to Jesus, that he confesses that Jesus, he wants to save him before Eichmann uh, goes down. And at the end, he, although he isn't able to save him, save him, the fact that Eichmann does not uh, acknowledge Jesus uh, means for Hull that, you know, Christians didn't commit the Holocaust. So it's a crazy um, conclusion. The same goes for Martin Amos's The Zone of Interest. Uh, I'm not crazy about that text. It, it drove me crazy for uh, the, the lack of umlauts and the ton of German. Like I have an entire long footnote in the text because 
it really, it, it, it bothered me, but that bothering is an intellectual provocation for me. Um, and so I think that's one reason that I, that I chose the text I did. Thank you. Um, I like the bothering, you know, isn't that why a lot of uh, what we do about it? Uh, there's another question in the, uh, in the chat by Denise Ibrizim who is asking um, precisely about the gendered, embodied, and effective perpetrator subjects and their potential of breaking with norms of masculinity. And in this regard, uh, the question is, is there a way of offering alternative masculine identity in relation to our established understandings of perpetrators? Wow, I'm mean, gonna I have to do some thinking about that. Um, I mean, I think there is, uh, and you see this with John, Jonathan Littell's text, which really is about the policing of masculinity and the, the expelling of the, the non-normative masculine, which is, which is, you know, a lot of scholars have written much uh, more uh, poignantly about this than I have, about the ways in which that perpetrator shell, the kind of the the, um, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Teva Light's idea of, the, you know, the, 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 the perpetrator armor that, the, the masculine armor that is erected in order to commit violence and then the ways in which that's perpetrated, uh, that's penetrated and then becomes the reason for instigating more violence. Um, I think that is operative. Um, and you also see, uh, especially in Sereni and Stangel, kind of a, a reversal of uh, gender roles, I mean, uh, where Sereni is the kind of the, the pushing, probing, logical um, uh, person who sort of um, pushes Stangel. And Stangel uh, performs a lot of uh, well, he cries and he, and he, um, what's, I, I have a hard time describing it. He, I think he actually performs a lot of this, um, um, vulnerability in order to kind of evade some of the questions that she's posing to him. So I do think that there are different gender dynamics going on. I don't know about an alternate masculine identity. I mean, certainly I don't think any of these books propose a way forward for these perpetrators, except maybe Mubush, who really does have a, a, quite a, um, an insightful reading of Eichmann. But I, I don't see any of, any of these books as a kind of a rehabilitation or a, a next phase for perpetrators to rehabilitate themselves. These are all really failed um, ethical uh, coming to terms. There is still time for other questions from the audience. Um, and while people maybe are thinking about whether or and what they would like to ask, um, maybe I can also uh, ask a question. I was wondering if we can take the affect discussion also to the fictional texts and talk more about, yeah, what is the e effective economy here? What are the strategies also formally, structurally in, in, in that, you know, in, in which way something like fascination or disgust or um, discomfort or uh, uh, other affects that are, are on the one hand circulating, of course, within the novel, but also between, you know, for the reader. If I'm wondering if, if you could uh, maybe talk a little more about that. Yeah, definitely the disgust, the abhorrence, um, these are, I think, uh, people have identified these, especially in um, the Hilzenbach text and the Littell text, which are really um, very different texts, but in some ways, like almost speak to each other in, um, in uncanny ways, even though I don't think Littell knew about Hilzenbach's text. And Hilzenbach was really upset with the, the uh, um, notoriety that Littell's text achieved because he had actually written this in the 60s, you know, and published it in the early 70s. But the ways in which those um, become a mode of narration, this, this constant um, focus on the permeability of bodies, the, the, the um, focus on um, 
scatological uh, uh, aspects. I mean, the, both of those texts seem, and they seem to, that those, those aspects of the text seem to be lightning rods for the readers. I think there's sort of a place to put our discomfort or a place to channel our discomfort in these really grotesque descriptions of bodies, of people, of relationships, um, et cetera. In Amos's text, it's very different. And I think the, the one thing I would say about the zone of, of interest that I do think Amos was trying to get at, and, and so therefore I, you know, I applaud him, he's, he's trying, um, is that he really is, is trying to imagine a world in which characters could be effectively relatable to, um, to readers in, in a real way. Um, and I don't think Littell is doing that. I mean, certainly we, we, we get 1,100 pages of Littell's narrator, Max uh, von Auer, um, but we don't, I don't, it's, it's very difficult to relate to him. It's, it's, it's easier to understand him or to follow him, but not to relate to him. Whereas Amos' second text, he's really trying to find a narrator that uh, in the Golo Thompson, who was one of the three narrators, that we kind of relate to. We want him to get the girl, as it were. Um, and I think that, that that's something um, that we're going to see more and more is ways in which we can, um, it, it's not just it, the shock value of having a perpetrator tell the story is, is going to wear off. It is because we have more of those, those narrators. So then the question is, do we want, do we want the narrator to succeed? I don't think ever I want Max, uh, um, Max Schultz to succeed uh, uh, in his ruse to pretend to be a, you know, a Holocaust survivor. I don't want Max Awa to succeed, but in Amos's text, you kind of want this narrator to, you know, he falls in love. You want him, I mean, it's a ridiculous kind of falling in love, but um, you, you kind of want him to succeed. And I think the, the real challenge is for us as re readers to recognize that we're drifting toward that kind of identification and to question it. I don't know whether, I think the, as I argued, the only way that Amos achieves it is by giving us two other narrators to, to pull back the attention. I don't think if the entire text were written in, in Golo Thompson's voice that we would, we would have that critical aspect. Thank you. Um, maybe a last word also from our two uh, discussants. Is there sort of some rounding off comments since I'm also, uh, we have uh, come to the conclusion of the session. Katharina? Yeah, I think I, I wanna say something about guilt since that is where I moved next and the way in which guilt is a, it is an experience of losing the ability to narrate your life. Uh, you know, it, it blocks. I mean, so there, there are two ways in which it uh, so fits to your text. One is it actually blocks empathy, right? The guilty, the perpetrator, I mean, what it means to be a perpetrator, what it means to be guilty means not to experience empathy. Um, and so the, you know, the engagement, certainly I'm now thinking about the prison chaplains, right? Or religiously speaking, how you save a perpetrator is to actually make humanize, right? Make them capable of feeling anything and feeling empathy. That is actually the catharsis, the purification is when they are able to feel anything. So I think that the silence or the inability to narrate your life is actually part of the experience of being guilty. Um, and, and that's why the mind reading also seems something, both the mind reading, but also then the fictional narration is something that only others can do because they themselves cannot. And so they need either need help or they need somebody else to do that. Um, anyway, I, I just thought that um, your book, where was it when I was struggling, you know, with my perpetrator? Because this concept of mind reading and theory of mind is so incredibly helpful, um, uh, as well as your, you know, the just your literary background is just uh, so. I'm just very, very happy that this 
book is out there and I'm absolutely sure that it will be used and useful as people continue to, um, you know, to engage uh, with, with perpetrators. So thank you for writing it. Thank you, Katarina. Um, hello again. Yes, uh, just to echo what Katarina said, thank you for writing it, Erin. I've got two slightly smaller points. Um, one is about the point that Katarina made, in fact, that um, most of the people addressing the perpetrator figure are non-German, which I thought was a really well-made point. And I wonder if it relates to the weird use of German in um, Martin Amos's The Zone of Interest, that though you would expect a non-German author perhaps to be able to approach a more universal notion of what it means to be a perpetrator, it actually seems to be a mockery against German and its language. Um, so that was one thought that it sprang to mind. And the other is about the detective story. Um, that I love reading detective novels, but I, I've actually come to feel that they don't offer closure, that the, the solution, as it were, at the end, doesn't really pay off the reading experience, that quite often when you pick up a detective novel to read it again, you can't actually remember who did it because it's the experience of the mystery that is so enthralling. I know Peter Brooks and other people have written about that, but I wonder if there's more to think about the notion of the detective story where it's not the solution, but it's the journey that's significant. Maybe that is even more relevant to Serenity, I'm not sure, because I've only just thought of it. But thank I you. think that's an excellent point, this the narrative digression, which is so, so important, you know, the delay of the actual payoff. And I think that that's what's so frustrating about Serenity is he, she tries to erect this thing into what is, a really amazing, I call it a masterwork because even though I find the end so problematic, I mean, first of all, she did it, you know, the, the fact that she sat in the prison cell with him for 70 hours and she did it, like that's, a, it's, a, it's such an achievement and it's such a well-written text and such, so sensitive. Um, and I think you're right, it's the journey. There are so many very insightful things and she doesn't have the same, you know, it was based, it, the, the, the book itself was based on her original art, article in the Telegraph, Telegraph, right? Um, and, uh, and then a series of articles that were published the same week in, in the site. And she doesn't have that kind of, I mean, she still has his kind of confession, but not this huge gesture to closure. He knew what had happened and therefore he chose to die basically. And I think that was the difference between, you know, what she what she had in the article and then creating this aesthetic object of the book that needed the closure. And so I think, you know, for me, the the the, the messiness of the article is actually stronger than the the po more polished part of the book that that creates the closure. Great. I uh... Unfortunately, we have to come to the end and have to conclude. Um, before uh, I send you off, and of course, before I uh, say a, a huge thank you to our panelists, let me just very briefly look towards the future while I still have you and your attention here. I would just uh, like to say that our uh, new books series will continue in the next academic year. Uh, we are in the process of um, putting together the program and are very excited to share it with you shortly. What I can say already is that the series will be opened on the 23rd of September at 4 p.m. Central European time. Um, and it is dedicated to the first event to Omar McDoom's book on Rwanda with Holly Nyseth Brehm and Jens Meyer Heinrich as discussants. So stay tuned. Now, thank you so much, Erin and Katarina and Sue, it was a pleasure um, listening and a pleasure to hear about uh, the book and also all uh, thoughts uh, from the two discussions. Thank you um, for the wonderful questions from the audience and um, well, a huge round of virtual applause. Um, I'm sure also from the audience to the three of you. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna, and thanks to all that attended. I appreciate it very much.